During our small series of interviews, you have seen us talk with comrades from the other side of the Atlantic, from Africa, from all over Europe, and also from local developments when it comes to social spaces. And now I'm sitting here with Kieran after a very nice presentation he has done in the anarchist space in our city. And um, he's from a land down under and he will tell us a bit about the social developments there, the anarchist movement or rather the anarchist scene in Australia and also how he personally got involved with the anarchist scene. So maybe you start with introducing yourself and tell us Kieran, how did you manage to become a part of an anarchist organization? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Uh, so my name's Kieran. I'm a member of the Melbourne Anarchist Communist Group. Uh, Melbourne's a city in the south of Australia, about five million people. How did I get involved? Um, I was politicised from a young age uh, around questions of climate, uh, climate change uh, and Australia's treatment of asylum seekers and refugees. Um, I left uh, electoral politics and believing that uh, electing any particular political party would address these issues about 2009. And I joined a small political group. I was living oh, maybe 300 kilometres away. So I joined uh, a small political group in the nearest major city uh, and, uh, and got involved then. Um, that group existed for nearly a decade before collapsing. Uh, and a couple of years ago, I joined the Melbourne Anarchist Communist Group. Hmm. Can you tell us a bit about the activities of the Melbourne Anarchist Communist Group? Like, what are you involved with? What are the day-to-day -day politics of your group? Uh, the Melbourne Anarchist Communist Group is committed to a class struggle perspective. Uh, so uh, our strategy externally is oriented very much towards the labour movement. Uh, a few of us are involved in through, uh, through our trade unions and what we would call a rank and file mm -hmm. strategy, attempting to create uh, groups within the trade unions that we're members of that fight for radical democracy in those trade unions, that fight for class struggle perspective uh, and class war rather than class compromise. Um, but the, the Melbourne Annex Communist Group, you know, so there's our sort of external focusing work. We're also involved in um, some campaigns around social issues, uh, particularly anti-fascism uh, and uh, the, the ongoing campaign in solidarity with refugees. Uh, but in terms of, um, uh, we also engage in political propaganda uh, and trying to develop an anarchist communist tradition in Australia. Uh, we publish our, our publication, The Anvil, every two months, uh, analysing a current issue from an anarchist communist perspective. Uh, and we also run something we call our Anarchist Political School, which is uh, an ongoing series of workshops introducing people to anarchist communist politics. And how do you see people reacting towards um, confrontation with anarchist ideas? Like, what would you describe the initial reaction of a typical Aussie when they get in touch with anarchists and maybe see anarchists taking action for the first time? So the label anarchist in Australia gets used to describe a broad array of sort of basically radical, sometimes anti-capitalist politics. Uh, in mainstream society, uh, where people are cognizant that anarchists exist, it's usually greeted with some degree of confusion. <laughs> what anarchism, that means no rules. Um, and then when they encounter anarchist communists, uh, minority within a minority tendency, um, the response <laughs> is initially often confusion. Uh, but we argue that anarchism is the uh, political dimension of a free society uh, and that communism is the economic dimension of that. Uh, and when we make the case that we're anarchist, as in we're against the state, we're against authoritarian social relations, we're for workers' control, we're for workers' self-management, and when we mean communist, we're talking about a society in which each are provided for according to need and each contribute according to ability. Sometimes that cuts through. Do you see anarchist traditions inside of Australia? Because you um, already said that you're developing 
towards um, creating an anarchist communist tradition through your actions and through your strategy. So are there living or maybe also um, <laughs> um, sadly dead anarchist traditions inside of Australia? There is an anarchist tradition in Australia going back uh, nearly 150 years. The first anarchist political group in Australia was formed in 1886 in Melbourne. It was a small discussion group called the Melbourne Anarchist Club. Uh, and the people involved in that soon became involved in uh, aspects of the labour movement and eventually the IWW in Australia, the Industrial Workers of the World. Uh, in the 20th century, uh, what, we would, what would come to be the anarchist political tradition came to Australia more or less with migrants, mm. uh, primarily from Southern Europe. And so Spanish anarchist refugees in Australia uh, and Spanish migrant uh, anarchists from the early 1900s, but then particularly after the Spanish Civil War and after World War II, and also Italian migrants and Italian refugee anarchists. Um, the anti-fascist movement in Australia, for mm. example, the first anti-fascist organisations in Melbourne were organisations of Italian migrants uh, fighting fascism in Australia. Uh, in the aftermath of the Second World War, so the Spanish anarchists, the CNT, maintained branches in Australia for 30 or 40 years after the Civil War. Uh, the Italian anarchists had some degree of organisation at times. Uh, a pair of Bulgarian emigres uh, mm -hmm. after the Second World War brought the concept of anarchist communism to Australia. Oh, really? These, these sort of early tendencies uh, intersected with the rise of the New Left in the 1960s, and then we see the emergence through the New Left of a larger self-described anarchist movement from the 1970s. But it was always very small, very marginal, and with very heterodox politics. So um, you have the anarcho-syndicalist traditions of the Spanish uh, and Italians, and then you had uh, people for whom anarchism meant literally no rules and taking drugs uh, in the form of what, what can mm -hmm. be called the Sydney Libertarians, uh, a tendency that came to be known as carnival anarchism with everything that went with that that you might expect. Uh, <laughs> and can, can, can you maybe uh, explain the tradition of Carnival anarchism a bit. I've really never heard this. <laughs> I, I really am not sure that I can explain carnival anarchism in a way that makes sense because I'm not sure the people involved understood it in a way that makes sense. Um, but think middle class dropout culture, no rules, um, 1960s, 70s, new left, uh, and very so very anti organizationalist. Certainly no focus on class politics. Um, think youth rebellion, late 60s, early 70s. Uh, but there were also groups, in, particularly in Brisbane, uh, influenced by the tradition of the group called Solidarity in the United mm. Kingdom. And so there was uh, the self-management group in Brisbane and several self-management societies in uh, other major cities. But again, this is a tradition we're talking about that is at most a few hundred people. Um, at time, uh, some people, depending on how you define the tradition, people using the label anarchist might be a few thousand people at different times, uh, but there was never any substantive uh, or explicit anarchist communist organisation uh, in Australia uh, until the 2000s. Uh, I, I should note the there was an, an anarcho-syndicalist federation in Australia. They would argue they still exist. <laughs> uh, that was formed uh, by the late 1980s, uh, which drew on elements of the Spanish anarchist movement, uh, elements who'd been attracted to the IWW, and they tried to form uh, an IWA affiliate in Australia that was called the Anarcho-Syndicalist Federation. They probably had their most successes in the 1990s uh, within the Tramways Union in Melbourne. Uh, but again, we're not talking a mass organisation. We're talking... Um, a group of people committed to the idea mm. of anarcho-syndicalism. Uh, and to be honest, that's that's what we are today. We're a group of people committed to the idea of anarchist communism. Okay. Uh, so I don't think it's meaningful to say that there's an anarchist movement in Australia. There are certainly people who identify with the label anarchist. There are uh, a social centre, a bookshop, 
Uh, there'll be some single issue campaign groups, people who come together and organize for particular issues, but substantive and ongoing organization is something that's been entirely absent. Uh, and a class-oriented anarchist communist federation or anarchist communist groups is something that's only, that, that has not mm -hmm. fully existed yet and is something we're building towards. Is there also a possibility of outside influences helping in building this? Because you already like um, uh, addressed the uh, influence from UK and solidarity from UK, but you also said that large migration movements, like, I mean, this is probably the same when you look at the United States that had a large influence in bringing the anarchist tradition and also especially the um, anarchist syndicalist or uh, anarchist uh, union tradition is there still a yeah a kind of um, network with other anarchist organizations maybe from the english-speaking world uk and but also neighboring new zealand and um, maybe even with uh, other countries that are neighboring australia indonesia papua new guinea or the different pacific islands Uh, the Melbourne Anarchist Communist Group participates in uh, an international coordination of anarchist communist to specifist uh, and related uh, groups around the world, which I believe uh, De Platform is also a member of. Um, and there's certainly been influence from, uh, in the internet age, particularly from these groups on the development of mm -hmm. a tradition in Australia. Um, so, for example, Zabalaza in South Africa and their production of Zabalaza mm. books has definitely had an influence because those zines have been everywhere and read. Um, the, the publication of Social Anarchism and Organization by the Anarchist Federation of Rio de Janeiro is something that over the past, uh, since it was published in 2006, has had an influence. People have been reading that and considering the ideas mm. um, of, a, of a specificism out of that. Um, the Workers' Solidarity Movement in Ireland and their various publications mm. have at times uh, had an impact on what people in Australia have been thinking is possible in terms of anarchist politics. Um, there's often in Australia this tendency to look abroad for the latest, greatest thing uh, <laughs> and to find the solution somewhere abroad somewhere. And if only we could bring it, bring it back to Australia and make it work. Um, And, and so we've seen people who've looked to the Zapatistas and tried to import Zapatismo to Australia completely out of context, or have looked to Rojava and uh, importing that oh, yeah. to Australia That's and so on. Um, the task that lies before us is to develop an anarchist analysis in the Australian context, responsive to the Australian context and for revolution where we find ourselves. I also found it really funny in the presentation you gave before, you also uh, talked about some anarchist uh, youth that um, do gap year in Europe after they get their secondary education and then um, come back from Berlin and uh, really uh, influenced by the whole riot culture from there and are like, uh, if, we, if we could only be as radical as they are there, as militant, I found this really funny because uh, it's probably Most of our viewers and listeners know that uh, German youth uh, do the same after they get secondary education, but only go to Australia to uh, get a spiritual awakening or <laughs> find their inner self. Um, but I also found it really interesting that it seems that a lot more influence comes from um, or is, uh, is taken as um, being part of an ideologic, uh, ideological tradition either by being um, platformist or by being anarcho-communist and not so much by um, being uh, connected through language or direct neighborhood um, between the different movements. It's worth commenting on the, the direct neighborhood. Australia um, sits like this kind of... Uh, white outpost in Asia. So there's this cultural disconnect from the region. Most Australians wouldn't think to look to Indonesia as anything other than a holiday destination mm. rather than a uh, home to a working class that we need to build connections with. Um, so no, there's not been the kind of uh, links of solidarity and cross-pollination uh, that there should be, I think, 
uh, between the movement in Australia and the movement in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. Then maybe we can top it off with you telling us a bit about the social developments inside of Australia, maybe even a bit about the whole um, militarization of society and also the imperialist importance of Australia and the whole region as this uh, white out spot inside of all these different nations, but also um, maybe very interesting to a lot of uh, listeners and uh, viewers um, the issue of uh, Aborigine rights and um, Aborigine struggles inside of Australia. To start with uh, the question of imperialism, uh, Australia I think could accurately be described as it was by Tom Lincoln in the title to his book, The Neighbour from Hell in the Pacific. <laughs> uh, Australia has an I think an imperialist relationship of domination towards Papua New Guinea, towards Timor-Leste, and towards a dozen or more Pacific states. Australian companies exploit uh, the resources of Papua New Guinea and other states. Australia uh, ripped the guts out of the oil and gas reserves in Timor-Leste. Australia has militarily intervened in the politics of Solomon Islands almost at will. And Australia has been able to do this because of its position in the US imperial system. Australia uses its apparent close relationship to the United States as a threat towards its neighbours. Resist us and face war with the United States. Mm. And therefore Australia invests significantly in military closeness with the United States. This is why Australia has joined every military adventure that the United States has called over the course of the post-war uh, period. It doesn't matter what the United States is invading, Australia wants in on it because we want the region to know uh, that the United States and Australia are so close. This idea that war with Australia would be mm. war with the United States. In the Pacific today, the Pacific, I think, post-World War II has largely been an American lake. And Australian imperialism depends on the Pacific remaining an American lake. If the balance of power changes in the Pacific, Australia's ability to act like the neighbour from hell will be massively curtailed. China is rising. China is growing in its economic capacity and military capacity and increasingly posing a challenge to US dominance. And the worst possible outcome from Australian capitalism's point of view is that the US should lose its position of primacy. It's in this context we need to understand the fact that the Australian government, the UK government and the US government have signed an agreement to provide nuclear submarines to Australia. Australia is spending in excess of 300 billion Australian dollars on this program, which is essentially Australia subsidising the US uh, naval presence in the Pacific. We're going to pay for part of the US submarine mm. presence uh, in the Pacific. The only reason to provide Australia with nuclear powered submarines is that so Australia can join a de facto blockade should it be necessary of China and keep the Chinese Navy bottled up in the East China Sea. This is a trajectory towards war. Mm. Um, the United States faces the position of contain and reduce the growth of China or accept the growth of China and accept in its own decline. And, and I don't think the US will accept its own decline. I think they'll fight for Australian capitalism uh, and, and the Australian state will push towards the United States uh, fighting any decline because its own position in the Pacific is tied up with the maintenance of US hegemony in the Pacific. The long-term trajectory, and look at, look at the propaganda coming out of the Australian ruling class and the propaganda in the media, etc. Uh, the, the, the trajectory at the moment is towards war with China. And I think that anarchists, the left, the union movement, Australian people need to push back against this because the outcome would be horrific. Uh, in terms of indigenous struggle, um, you know, within Australia, Aboriginal people to this day die 20 years younger uh, than anyone else, uh, than, than other groups in the country. Average life expectancy is that much lower, which reflects the, the situation of poverty and ill health that Aboriginal people at large find themselves in within Australia. Aboriginal people 
are murdered by the police at an alarming rate. The unaccountable deaths of Aboriginal people at the hands of the police are ongoing. No police officer in Australia has ever been convicted of any offence concerning the death of an Aboriginal person. Um, Aboriginal lands, such that land that remains to some degree under Aboriginal control is continually under threat from mining and pastoral interests. Rio Tinto, an iron ore company, has record blowing up Indigenous sacred sites in order to make way for their mining uh, programs and has done so yet again in recent weeks. Um, the, uh, so all of these things, um, the, the struggle, how do, I, how do I bring this together? I would say Australian capitalism as a project is founded on the genocide and dispossession of Aboriginal mm -hmm. people. And the process of dispossession continues because Australian capitalism continually eats away at what Indigenous control there is. The demands of Aboriginal people for the return of land and for sovereignty, the recognition of Aboriginal control over Aboriginal affairs and Aboriginal control over Aboriginal land are an, aff are an affront to Australian capitalism. And so it's essential, not just for any moral reason, um, but also uh, for in order to wage the war against capitalism in Australia, to act in determined solidarity mm. with the resistance of Aboriginal people. Now, I think uh, a lot of people often forget that because um, Australia is such a um, large exporter of a lot of raw materials that the whole world is interconnected with this attack on Indigenous rights in Australia. But also I'm uh, really shocked about hearing uh, about this whole confrontation between China and the US in um, the Pacific and also Australia's role in this and this whole war looming always in the, in the minds of the people and the lives of the people because I guess that's uh, something that a lot of us can really feel right now in Europe with the whole confrontation of the Western Bloc and Russia in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I can only say all the best uh, to the people right now struggling in Australia, all the best to the comrades at work down under and um, really big thanks Kieran for giving us a short introduction into anarchism in Australia. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for having me. Cheers. <laughs>